Welcome everyone to the third Second Saturday lecture series presented at our Russian History Museum. Uh, we're very excited for you to join us today, this Saturday. I'm seeing a lot of familiar names, so thank you to those of you who have been with us from the very start and welcome to all new guests and individuals. Uh, we are very much looking forward to this iteration of the lecture and more lectures to come. So just a few housekeeping details and note for you, notes for you all as participants. Uh, we will have a Q&A portion of the lecture following Karen's presentation. And how you will submit questions for the Q&A is at the very bottom of your Zoom screen. There's a little Q&A button uh, with two chat bubbles. So when the time comes, I will remind everyone in the audience and you can submit some questions and we will seek to answer those to the best of our abilities here. Uh, we will have limited chat functionality during the lecture itself. However, at various points in the lecture, we do have some exciting news and information to share with you all as guests. Uh, we will supply you with that information. Uh, so a little bit of a lecture bio, just so you can all get to know a little bit of who will be speaking to you all today. Uh, we, of course, have Dr. Karen Kettering, uh, who received her doctorate in art history from Northwestern University. Her dissertation was a study of sculptor Natalia Dianko's career in the late Imperial and Soviet periods. She has held positions as curator of Russian art at Hillwood Museum and Gardens and senior specialist in Department of Russian Art at Sotheby's. She's also the author of studies on Russian and European decorative arts, design, icons, and paintings. And her research has focused most recently on the creation of a market for Russian art in America as well as the history of Russian portrait diamonds. She's a co-curator of the exhibition Tradition and Opulence, Easter in Imperial Russia, which is currently on view at the Museum of Russian Icons, and includes a number of examples from our museum's collection, including some ecclesiastical cuffs. She currently heads an art advisory and appraisal firm, and we welcome her today to our second Saturday lecture. Uh, so thank you all again for joining us, and Karen, whenever you are ready, begin. Well, hello, everyone. While I'm starting this, I just wanted to say I have attended all of these, and um, the questions have been incredible, so I'm pretty sure I won't be able to answer all of yours, and I therefore invite everyone to um, pitch in because I, I know a lot of people who are here with us and I know that they probably will know the answers that I don't. And uh, finally, there were some questions that I had myself, but we're all in the terrible situation, or most of us are, that all the libraries are closed. So, so to start, during the second half of the 19th century, the rituals and celebrations of imperial coronations in Russia grew ever more extravagant evolving into complex theatrical events staged for the international press as much as the empire's inhabitants. These spectacular series of displays, sometimes stretching as long as three or four weeks, demanded rich costumes for the many participants. Of course, the Empress's coronation gowns, everyone's imperial mantles, or at least the imperial family's imperial mantles, which you see most of the garments that you see in Lawrence Tuxen's famous painting, the coronation heralds who uh, announced the news, and of course, the many members of the clergy who provide, uh, presided over the religious services. The vestments worn by the clergy serving at the coronation of Nicholas II and Alexandra Fyodorovna in May 1896 were fitting garments for the lavish festivities. The metropolitans of St. Petersburg, Moscow, and Kiev, together with 50 bishop, over 50 bishops and other members of the higher clergy, and an additional 34 members of the court clergy, were outfitted in full vesture. And by the way, this was on view last year, and I think this gives you a sense of the, um, of the, the massive nature of these garments. So the Ministry of the Imperial Court, the agency charged with producing the coronation events, turned to the firm of A and B Sapozhnikov to supply the unique fabrics from which all of the vestments were sewn. 
The firm already had a close relationship to the court, having supplied richly figured brocades, silks, velvets, and other textiles for the coronation of Alexander II and Alexander III. They supplied the uh, most important vestments for all sort of important church and state events. The official celebrations of the um, the centennial of 1812, the opening of the Church of Christ uh, the Savior. All of these moments, Sapochnikov participated, but also at moments like this, they produced the textiles for Nicholas II's costume at the 1903 Winter Ball. The firm was founded by Grigory Sapochnikov, who we see there on the left, and his future bride, Vera Alexeyeva. These names are um, largely forgotten in Russian history, and I think they should not be. It was a marriage, a perfect alliance. He had, uh, he had founded a silk factory that rapidly became very important for the ability to produce figured, you know, some kind of patterns, but not necessarily with gold. But then he married a woman from the family that produced gold thread and what's called gimp. And that's a terrible name in English, but what can you do? You've seen it. It's the kind of decorative borders made out of gold, but wrapped around silk cores. And if you've seen a miter, you've seen what these uh, gold threads can do in the hands of the right person. This miter from the museum's collection is a compendium of all of the different sorts of gold threads, or some of them, all, uh, most of which were undoubtedly made at the Alexeyev factory, and what can, one could do with them. So you can see that they can be finished in different textures, diameters, and shapes. You can achieve subtle color differences by wrapping the gold around different colors of silk. And in this area, you can see how the gold has fallen away and you can see that it's a yellowish orange silk and it's become twisted or meant to be twisted. And it gives you an entirely different texture than say these areas here where it's quite flat and straight or areas like this where there's a slight twist to it as well. It's interesting when they talk about these gold textiles and gold threads in uh, both today and in history in museums and elsewhere, we talk about them in ways, in the same way that we talk about metalwork, things like the covers of icons. And um, I was so pleased to see that the museum actually has an icon that has a cover made entirely of gold thread embroidery with a few other pieces. And there's an interesting sort of give and take between goldsmiths and uh, gold embroiderers, because of course, if you look at this icon currently on view, you can see that the goldsmiths were trying to imitate lace and things like that, while over here, the embroiderers were trying to imitate metalwork. But back to the Sapochnikovs. Now, um, I don't think Hannah told you there'll be a quiz on these. A kid, a kid, but um, I'm belaboring all this and I'm sorry because the Sapochnikovs are a very underlooked family, despite the fact that they were related by marriage to and part of some of the most important events at, artistic events at the end of the 19th century. So, Vera and Gregory had three children, and probably the one who married into the best-known family was the daughter Yelizaveta, who married Sava Mamontov, and she was an, just a key figure at the art, artist colony at Abramtsova. And um, I probably am too focused on art history, and I'm sorry if I'm going down a rabbit hole for some of you, but I, I think that many of you know it's an artist colony or was near Moscow. And some of the most important artists of the period worked there. So we're talking about Ilya Repin, Mikhail Rubel, Valentin Serov, Konstantin Karovin, Mikhail Nesterov, 
Elena Palianova, Vasily Palianov, and Viktor Vesnetsov. The middle son, Vladimir, married a member of the Yakunchikov family. And through that, they became actually directly related to Maria Yakunchikova, one of my favorite artists, Vasily Palianov, a key figure. And of course, um, Vera herself was related to this guy, Konstantin Stanislavski, who was really born Alexeyev. And now, to make it easier on you, this gratuitously cute child, this is Vera and Grigory's granddaughter, Vera Mamutova, and this is probably, I think, the best known, and some people consider it to be the most important painting of 19th century Russian art. And uh, the, the sort of local history museum located near it has um, put on the web this delightful photo of, of her. And um, I'm hoping that that clears your vision after having to see those family trees I created mostly for myself to, to understand who all these people were. So Vera turned the, let's go back to the kid. Vera turned the firm over to her two sons in 1870 and they ran the company successfully, beautifully. They brought in all sorts of new technical equipment and they started to figure out ways to bring their parents to specialties. These figured silks with gold thread together. They reorganized it under the name A and V Sapotnikov, which is probably the most common name, what everyone knows. And their real success was achieved under Vladimir. Unfortunately, both Vera and the other brother, Alexander, died in 1877. He took full control, and it was under him that he continued to secure contracts for the interiors of the Kremlin Palace, the first services at the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in 1883, and the, and the coronations of both Alexander III and Nicholas II. The firm was selected for their ability to consistently produce the finest fabrics incorporating significant gold threads. And what we're looking at here is not Spozhnikov, but the precursor, where they came from. It's always important that vestments or one hopes that vestments can always be appropriately rich and appropriate to the venue. In the 18th century, we see many examples of hybrid garments like this, in which someone has donated very expensive 18th century French brocaded silks of a kind used for fashionable dresses. This is possibly two dresses. And the yoke is made from a kind of Russian pearl embroidery that was so in expensive, it's a 17th century piece, that we can trace the movement of these through wills. They, the value was so great, this was something that would actually be named in a will. And uh, so when you sometimes see people putting their own jewelry on an icon cover, or somehow donating something very rich of their own to the church, this is something like that, where someone has clearly given or two different people have clearly given some of their most valuable family pieces in order to make something new. And um, I hope you guys can see my little cursor, but I think you can see it. Sometimes you have to force things in. So the threads are a little uh, show here a little, and it's not always easy to take what was you know, clearly not a religious garment and turn it into one. Those stones, by the way, are all pastes. Don't worry, those aren't all, all sorts of precious stones. So this garment, by the way, is in the collection of Hillwood and is occasionally on view. And that's Hillwood Museum in Washington, DC. And as we move into the 19th century, the innovation was to be able to make things out of a full cloth that was made specifically and exclusively for vestments, for church use. This wasn't something that was also someone's dress or someone's, or someone's vest that's richly embroidered or something like that. These were purpose made. They might look like other kinds of fabrics, but they were purpose made. And by the way, um, the museum has an extraordinary collection of vestments and uh, church textiles. 
and Michael sent me photos and I have shoved all of them into this lecture. So we'll be here till, um, I don't know, 2 p.m. ish, 3. We'll see. You guys, everyone can just leave me here. What Saposhnikov's big um, innovation is, and I, I think it's really clear, is that unlike a lot of silk with a little gold, they managed to be able to weave these very difficult threads into a garment that is made almost completely of gold. And again, when we say gold, we're talking about gold and silver wrapped silk threads. And uh, these two garments, one at Hillwood and one at the Russian History Museum, you can see are both by Sapochnikov. And um, I have to say the Russian History Museum is probably a bit more expensive because it incorporates both silver work here as well as the gold. Oh, you can see the silver much better there. Whereas Hillwoods uses only gold. So you can see actually it's very, this was news to me. I didn't realize there were different versions of some of these textile designs. We know very little about these uh, unless the garment itself falls open and you can see the selvage with the maker's name. It's a uh, best guess. Ladimir also made sure that the company had an international as well as national presence. They exhibited throughout at all of the European expositions from London in 1851 to World War II. And for us in America, it's very exciting to know that they exhibited in 1876 in Philadelphia. And um, Philadelphia Museum of Art has actually been able to acquire one of the panels that they showed there. These things are all over the US and possibly all over Europe. So should you happen to see something I'm including here, this is what the selvage looks like. You can see the name of the firm, the imperial warrant. So keep an eye peeled, let us know if you find anything. And um, just so you know about costs, this very interesting notice in a review of the 18, uh, the 72 Paris exposition notes that um, a yard of this gold cloth cost about 100 or cost $115. And that's about $3,000 in today's money. So it gives you a sense of the incredible expense. And you can see here at the um, 1893 Chicago exposition, unfortunately, there's not a better picture. Back here in this glass case, is everything by Sapochnikov. All of this remained in the US. So finally, you patiently been waiting, finally we're at the garments themselves. And this is actually from the collection of the Russian History Museum. The selection of such an important element of the sacred coronation had to be made carefully. On May 4th, 1895, a full year before the coronation was to take place, Minister of the Imperial Court, Ilarion Varonsa Dashkov, met with Nicholas II to show him photographs of a number of ancient vestments in the patriarchal sacristy. From these, the emperor was to select one garment that would be used as the basis for the design of the new coronation vestments. The Ministry of the Imperial Court's official report on the agency's preparations for the festivities unfortunately does not list the uh, other contenders. We only know about one. We don't know who chose them. We don't know who compiled them. Let me change that. I don't know. There might be someone who's been in the Russian archives at Ergia and who knows. So if you are that person, please let us know at the end. It is possible that it was Varons of Dashkov who also served as minister of the imperial court for Alexander III. Although he and Nicholas had disagreed quite sharply on the question of how long the new emperor should wait until after his father's death before marrying, they shared an interest in the so-called Russian style, Ruski steel. Uh, the term Ruski steel in art was never used with scrupulous precision, and it's come to denote a changing variety of styles revived or created in 19th century Russia by different groups of historians, architects, designers, and artists, many of whom disagreed sharply. 
what these various styles termed Russian shared or aimed for was an attempt to reflect an ethnically and nationally true form of decoration, usually described as design or ornament that had appeared or been in use before any sort of outside or foreign influence could be detected. It, could all, it was also often thought that it somehow resided in folk art and the kind of things produced by the peasantry, which you see in this extraordinary, that silver and enamel, that basket, and it's created very carefully to imitate lace, embroidered lace. Few of the style's proponents could agree on what constituted foreign influence and therefore when this might have occurred. And one of the main sources for it is this book by a person called Sontsev, which, which pulled together images and all sorts of collections of ancient treasures. And of course, the problem was a lot of them were diplomatic gifts, so they were not necessarily purely Russian. And so when people use them as a source, as we'll see, they were sometimes trying to evoke 17th or 16th century Muscovy and um, actually ending up in, say, Venice in the 16th century. And so this preference for Russian national sources creates a bit of a problem when we consider the model he selected for the coronation vestments. This is he being Nicholas II. That object, you see the front and the back on the screen, it's at the Kremlin Armory, Moscow Kremlin's Armory Museum, is typically described as the Sappos of Patriarch Adrian. This garment can be described in many, many ways. It is most prominently made not from Russian cloth, but from 17th century Italian, most likely Venetian, voided velvet. And probably one of the best known examples of that is in Bronzino's portrait of Eleanor of Toledo. You see that fabric is probably one of the most debated fabrics in art history. Avoided velvet is one in which areas of the ground weave are left free of the raised pile. And these technical terms, you know them basically if you own a bath or a beach towel, those big loops that are in velvet or that are in a towel are what we're going to be talking about. If they were removed, you would just see the ground. Now, rich velvets and brocades like this were not produced in Russia until well into the 18th century, but extravagant examples were imported or sent as diplomatic gifts from the Italian peninsula and the Ottoman Empire as early as the 15th century. Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich one of Nic Nicholas's models of patronage became particularly enamored of Venetian goods. He's sending four separate embassies to the city in part to buy the city's rich textiles and to try to secure the right to purchase the fabrics free of duty. He wanted a tax break. The crimson coloring of the velvet's background weave alone would have made this an expensive fabric. I think you can see that it's retained its color. It, it's extraordinary. To, este to achieve this shade with such depth and consistency that it allows little fading even after four centuries, a workman had to dye the silk threads in several pigment baths made from plants and insects imported at great expense from Asia and the Levant. In the voided areas, a supplementary weft in gold thread, or to be more precise, gold wrapped around a core of silk thread, was used to render a large scale all over floral pattern that was, uh, had characterized Renaissance velvets for several centuries. Leave aside all the technical stuff, just um, hopefully gather that they had to do, there were many, many, many more steps involved in order to get this mix of what we might recognize as modern day velvet, as gold cloth, and then what's going on here and here. This kind of supplementary extra stuff would have been a very thick kind of stiffened gold, fat, um, gold thread. And the loops, like you might see on your bath towel, were made almost of wire, so they would stand up and never fall. So basically what it comes down to is these fabrics were sculptural. 
you would see things in this that one would not see in any other kind of fabric. As you can imagine, the extraordinary difficulty of weaving such a complex, almost three-dimensional fabric or three-dimensional fabric would have raised the cost of this cloth to such a height, the group of potential buyers would be minuscule. Records of the Pasolsky Prikas, or court inventories, often indicate precisely when a given Renaissance velvet or silk arrived in Moscow, and whether it had been given as a diplomatic gift, commissioned, or simply purchased abroad. Unfortunately, no such information for this fabric has yet been found, to my knowledge. This cloth is first recorded in court inventories in 1679, which say that it was used to make a ceremonial overcoat for Tsar Fyodor Alexeyevich. And remember I said this, this garment can be described a lot of ways. We usually call it the Sapphos of Patriarch uh, Adrian, but it had a whole other life before that. It is possible that it was part of the unusually rich inventory of gifts, including a large quantity of velvet, satins, and Italian brocades brought by the embassy of Konrad von Klink to Alexei Mikhailovich in January 1676. It's generally presumed that the gifts had been given in hopes of securing the Tsar's permission to search for a Siberian route to Persia and China. And it would make sense that it could have included such a lavish fabric. Alexei died shortly after the embassy's arrival and the 15-year-old Fyodor Alexeyevich completed the departure ceremonies. It is also possible that it arrived during his short reign, Fyodor's short reign, because he sponsored the establishment of an ultimately short-lived velvet manufactory in 1681, dictated a schedule for the wearing of such sumptuous, classic, such sumptuous cloths at court, and had he lived longer, would certainly have rivaled his father as a patron of fine arts. I've belabored this. It's really important to know whether this was a gift or commission because it would do much to explain the significance of the unusual confirmation of the double-headed eagle. I think all of you don't recognize that eagle. On 14th, uh, and by the way, the one on the right is from the museum's, you know, 1895, 1896 garment. The one on the left is Adrian's. So, in 1667, well before this was made into a sacros, Alexei Mikhailovich had published an ukaz promulgating a new state seal. The ukaz specified that the double-headed eagle should be thrice crowned to represent Kazan, Astrakhan, and Siberia, the three glorious kingdoms which submit to his imperial majesty. And in its claws should be an orb and a scepter for proclaiming the most gracious sovereign, his imperial majesty, autocrat, and possessor. There's a lot wrong with these eagles. There's only one crown. Their uh, wings are lowered. And of course, <laughs> where's the orb? Whether it was a commission or somewhat confused gift, the cloth seems not to have pleased Fyodor. Only two years later in 1681, it reappears in a court inventory now having been altered to make a caftan for his 15-year-old brother, Ivan Alexeyevich. After Ivan's death in 1696, you know, this garment wouldn't have been thrown out, this cloth was expensive, but at that point it was finally altered for the last time. The, uh, you can probably see that there's a very special kind of trim added around, and that was added to the sleeves and to the front, and it alternates crowns and pearls and semi-precious stones. And around the neck was embroidered an inscription identifying the garment as a sacos made in 1696 for Patriarch Adrian. So here we are, finally, 1696. And as I've belabored, there are many, many ways to describe this garment that Nicholas II selected as a model for the coronation vestments, as a particularly fine example of 17th century voided velvet, as a heraldic rarity that has not yet been adequately explained, as a luxurious ceremonial garment for the short-lived Tsar Fyodor Alexeyevich, as Adrian Sakos, as a vestment that took its final shape exactly 200 years before Nicholas's coronation, 
or for the longest part of its useful existence, a caftan belonging to Ivan Alexeyevich. The Ministry of the, Important, of the Imperial Court and the new emperor focused entirely on its brief four-year period as Adrian Sackles. And that focus, I would argue, is the key to understanding its significance within the larger scheme of the coronation. Adrian, of course, had been the final patriarch of Russia, holding the office from 1690 to 1700. When he died in October 1700, Peter the Great simply declined to convene a council to elect a successor, and within a year had reorganized church administration so that its property and most of its decision-making power were brought under state control. It's not clear what Nicholas understood of Adrian and his career, but um, we know that one of his most important tutors in Russian history was a specialist in 17th century political history and would have been able to discuss this patriarch with him in great detail. Much of what had been published about Adrian by 1890 clearly detailed his opposition to Peter's campaigns of secularization, his adoption of Western European customs of dress and grooming, and even his fondness for tobacco. Other works outlined his suspicion of foreigners and their ability to corrupt Muscovite religiosity and morals. As various scholars have argued, Nicholas believed that it was through public acts of piety or overt religiosity that he could establish a quote, direct though unspoken and invisible spiritual bond with the people. A shared sense of piety he believed had persisted from ancient Russia. So for certain sophisticated spectators, the vestment's design could be seen as a repudiation of certain secularizing tendencies. Now, returning to 1895, it seems safe to say that Vladimir Sapochnikov was actually present at the meeting of Nicholas. Oh, sorry, there's Adrian himself, I apologize. Okay, so Vladimir Sapochnikov, it seems very, very likely was there at the meeting of Nicholas II and Count Barons of Dashkov at which they selected the source garment. The ministry's published reports note that the emperor selected a model and at the same time approved the use of a new sort of cloth the Sapochnikov, Sapochnikov firm had developed. Quote, the making of which is a trade secret of the firm. Referred to in the reports as gold on gold, it is apparently the creation of subtle, subtle differences in the color of gold by wrapping the precious metal around different colors of silk thread, ranging from white to deep crimson. And as I said, there's really strong connections to metalwork. And you see here actually a Fabergé case in multicolored gold, which is very close in this same design sense. The completed fabric resembles various techniques of metalworking such as four color gold and the combination of areas alternately um, polished and left matte to give an object greater depth. The yokes of the garments, oops, let me go backwards. The yokes of the garments were particularly striking, combining a machine made version of much older techniques of hand weaving or embroidery. The crown itself rendered in the looped brocade of the eagles on the original model while the shadowing Oh, it's just like that. Well, the shadowing around it appears to have been finished in an embroidery technique of shaded gold in which different areas were couched or sewn down to create a layer of light or a pattern of light and shadow. As the 1897 report, the post-coronation report noted with great happiness, this was uh, most of the fabric was made, or the main fabric was made by machine with no manual techniques whatsoever. And uh, this is not to say that there was a great rejection of handwork. And what you see on the screen here are really true extraordinary items. They are hand embroidered and by tradition, they were embroidered either by Alexandra Fyodorovna or Elizabeth Fyodorovna. But as you can imagine, being able to weave a fabric, let's see, like this on a machine was very, very difficult. And it was a great sort of technological and artistic coup for Russia in terms of its, its um, 
competition with, say, French makers of silks or their English competitors. Now, the extensive use of machine technology meant that Sapochnikov could also rapidly finish this enormous order. And this had been one of the reasons they'd been picked in the past. In 1856, apparently, Vera had been asked, can you finish this order in time for the vestments and the dresses and everything? And she said, oh, yes, and went back and said to her family, I don't know if we can pull this off or if the workers are going to rise up and quit en masse. But um, this became a family specialty, being able to pull all nighters and finish these things. So it also meant that the finished product, even if it did reproduce the outlines of an old pattern, was clearly a new technique. The fabric literally seems to be cloth of gold, a kind of misunderstood term taken to its most literal extreme. The fabric is so stiff with metal that it can hardly bend or flow. The apparels, the orphrey-like bands decorating the cuffs, yoke, and hem, faithfully reproduce the alternating eagles and crowns embroidered on Adrian's garment in pearls and semi-precious stones. But the gold on gold technique, unfortunately, slightly obscures them. So, we have to consider these garments not only from the point of the commissioner, Nicholas II, but also from the point of view of everyone who was admitted to these events through mass media. Although Nicholas II wanted to evoke the visual culture of 17th century Muscovy wherever possible, the latest technique of manufacturing managed to create a visually extraordinary but quite modern garment. And as I said, what others made of that was very important, quite clearly. The government invited over 300 members of the Russian and international press to observe the events, an unprecedented number. And uh, basically a reporter from Reuters wrote a very long report and filed it and it was reproduced in newspapers simultaneously in newspapers in Dunn County, North Carolina, which you see there on the left. In uh, the one on the right is in Chicago, but at the same time in their counterparts in London or in Sydney, there was also a version of this in French newspapers, I know for sure, and probably in other languages as well. The Ministry of the Imperial Court established a correspondence bureau with workspace for journalists and uh, everyone could get all of the information. They could get press releases explaining everything and historical and artistic information on the thrones, on the vestments. And uh, they selected what was of interest to their readers and they, it was they who came up with this phrase. Um, things, they would say things like it's a kaleidoscope of colors, a mass of brilliance, and it described primarily the Sapochnikov fabrics, not just the masses of jewels, but all of the things the Sapochnikovs made for these celebrations. It was the Reuters reporter who uh, described the clergy in their vestments as a mass of brilliance, and thus giving me my title. And this is a double-edged sword, of course. Oh. What everyone loved most of all, by the way, I had to put this in here, the museum has a wonderful print, were the electric illuminations of the Moscow Kremlin, which as you can see, were quite stunning. But, okay, the double-edged sword, of course, is that you've let reporters in and you can't control them. So that the information on the coronation and the festivities rapidly became folded into and understood internationally as being one and a part of the disaster on the Khadink field, unfortunately. So these garments had a very short life, May of 1896. What happened to them after 1917? How did they get to us? First of all, I have to thank the very eagle-eyed Michael Perikrestov, who noticed that these garments were reused by Moss Film in 1973 for the wildly popular Ivan Vasilyevich Back to the Future, as it's called in English, which you can see if you haven't seen it on YouTube for free on Moss Film's channel with English subtitles. And uh, 
some people might find that disturbing, but um, I think what we're going to see going forward might really, some people might find it upsetting. So sorry on your day off. I think it's fairly well known, the story of the Soviet government's destruction of and confiscation of church valuables. Vestments were swept up together with icons, together with church silver, all together. And uh, they were sold often to foreigners, to tourists, in mass and in these large pieces, and uh, for pretty reasonable prices given the time period. And the reason that they were sold or collected is um, in the 1920s, and for the previous 20 years, it had been quite the style to incorporate older textiles into interior design. The person who really brought them to America, of course, is Arm and Hammer and Hammer Galleries. And the way Arm and Hammer wanted to present them was very, very different. Arm and Hammer presented it to the United States as uh, these, first of all, he appealed to this kind of design aesthetic. Here you'll have copes and chasubles. This phrase was used often by interior designers. And he says, you know, these were imperial gifts. And this, by the way, if um, you haven't been to the Gardner Museum in Boston, this is a really good example of church textiles being used as decoration. This um, cope you see in various vestments are incorporated into a room about 16th century Italy. And they were so important, it was her particular love of collecting, that they're incorporated in her key portrait of herself, which is the sergeant portrait. That didn't seem to have stuck. So um, Victor and Armour Ham, Arm and Hammer tried a new tack. What they started to say was, well, the Soviets were just going to burn these for the metal and um, we were able to save them. We entered the royal palace and rescued these household and personal treasures of former czars before they were burnt for their actual gold and silver content. And um, as you saw from most of these vestments, most didn't contain a lot of silver or gold. So that, that, that seems kind of, uh, I'm suspicious of it. What they did do, and what um, might seem quite strange, is they did take a lot of vestments of different kinds, and they hired people to convert them, cut them up and convert them into evening bags, little pouches, most of which had little mirrors, to coin purses, match cases, things like that. And this is a page from their catalog, and I think you can see Hopefully the prices, they range from as low as $1.50 up to $35. And some of these were really nice. This is an example that's still in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. When you open these things, they always say, made of Imperial Russian brocade from the Hammer collection. And when you bought these, besides that gilt stamp, you also got an extraordinary uh, sort of receipt. And Hammer, these came with all of his things. They're really wonderful if you ever get a chance because they are just uh, fabulous lies. Uh, they're typed on something that looks like parchment paper. And as you can see, this one that came from one of the little, gar uh, one of the little purses said, uh, these, these fabrics came from chapels of the Romanovs. They were brought from the various palaces Soldiers of the present government sorted them for burning. And fortunately, Dr. Armand Hammer heard of the plan and succeeded in saving a large number of the brocades by purchasing them. Occasionally, he makes it sound like he actually leapt into burning buildings, like uh, someone saving a child or a cat or something. Uh, we all, all of us who, <laughs> from, the, uh, from this group of four who prepared this, all agree that this is undoubtedly the creepiest. These are drinks coasters that he made. They seem to be quite rare, but they are uh, a mix of what is clearly liturgical textiles and one that might be secular. Their main competitors, the Schaefer Collection, did the same thing. You can see um, even when they renamed themselves Olivier Roussy, you can see the pin cushions they made and other little envelopes slash 
coin purses. If we go back to these vestments, investment very much like the one at the Russian History Museum is in the collection at Hillwood and it's still got its price tag from the agency selling these things off. And it was priced at 600 rubles. I don't know what the exchange rate was, but um, it seems to me like this would probably be in the range of um, several hundred dollars. So with that, um, I am aware that I've taken you all over the place during this. And uh, I feel like we had to go to all these various different places in order to understand these garments and the people who made them and wore them and designed them. And um, so I can't possibly give you some wonderful coherent conclusion as one might hope for, but I can say that uh, it's, I just hope that when you look at these, you understand or at least appreciate a little more everyone who was involved in this amazing story of how they got to us. So with that, uh, Hannah, should I stop sharing? I realize I know how to start this, but not how to stop. Sure, so I would recommend maybe just leaving the presentation on screen uh, a little bit later during the Q&A session, just so people can reference the images. But for the time being, uh, thank you again, Karen. Uh, I'm actually going to hand things over to Nick Nicholson for a few remarks before continuing onward with the Q&A. Uh, so if everyone, uh, if you have questions, again, the chat function is at the bottom of your screen, Q and A, the two little text bubbles. Uh, come up with your questions as we discuss, and we'll get into that section in just a moment here. Hi there. I just wanted to thank you, Karen, so much for your lecture. It was fabulous and interesting, and it is a joy for the museum when a presenter finds some things in the collection and they're able to show them to the world. So thank you so much for that, for the a massive, brilliant color. It certainly was. My name is Nick Nicholson. I'm the Director of Development at the Museum of Russian History in Jordanville. And uh, before we move on to the question and answer section, I just wanted to invite everybody who's visiting today to take a look at our newly relaunched website. You can get a far clearer idea of the things that are available in our collection and also be brought up to speed on some recent things that have happened at the museum, one of which is the restoration of a rare painting by Vestilov, which is terrific and interesting, and also uh, some more information and highlights on our involvement with the exhibition Tradition and Opulence, which is currently at the Museum of Russian Icons in Clinton, Massachusetts. So uh, before we let you go, I'd also like to let you know that we're going to uh, put up in the chat function the address of the website and also the address of the all important donate button so that we can continue to bring activities like this to all of you at home during the pandemic and beyond. We hope you will consider giving us a donation no matter how small or how large. Gratefully accepted, take a look in the chat function. And I am now going to pass you back to uh, my colleague, uh, Hannah, who will work with Karen on the question and answer period. Thank you so much. All right, so thank you. We're getting a few questions in already. So please come up with what you have. No judgment from me, I promise, or from any of us. Uh, and one question that I see on the screen that I'm actually very curious about considering how humid and warm it has been in New York State, I can't imagine actually wearing uh, these objects. Uh, and someone asked, what is the weight of the object? How much do these things weigh? The Hillwood Museum and became interested because we were recataloging these and they are extraordinarily heavy. I want to say that just the, um, the circles or the Sicarian weighed about 10 to 15 pounds and they don't bend. They are almost entirely metal. So by the time that you added all of the different elements, it was, um, the emperor was wearing an ermine mantle. What can you say? Everyone suffered together in the May sunshine. And uh, by the way, I think you can see that um, because they're made of so much gold, they retain gorgeous color. Nevertheless, the, I, I think you can see on this eagle, it's already becoming exposed. The, the gold is falling away because, because it doesn't bend. And um, 
that makes these very difficult to conserve. I'm putting in a little um, plea for money. It is incredibly difficult to show and conserve textiles. The museum has a really important collection. And um, while there are examples of these in many American museums, surprisingly, they don't get attention, they don't get showed, and they're probably very last on the list for conservation budgets. So I hope I've guilted everyone into it. Very good. Uh, so grouping two questions together here, back to kind of the physicality and the makeup of these objects. Uh, first off, are they lined? And second off, were the Tsar and Tsarina's mantles originals, or did they wear the mantles of Alexander III? The uh, mantles were, Maria Fyodorovna had hers, the Dowager Empress, but um, they were made anew for Nicholas II and Alexandra Fyodorovna. And these garments, yes, let me go back and see if we can see somewhere, are always lined. And um, I have to say it is a gift to historians when those seams fall apart because otherwise you don't see the selvage, which shows the name of the maker. And I think you can see just here on this edge that it's usually a linen, and it's often yellow on these gold, these gold fabrics, because I think it helped somehow to create greater radiance. I'm not sure, or maybe it just was meant to. Do we have any other views? No. It was just meant to um, somehow coordinate. All right, uh, next question is, is there any additional information about this relationship or this competition uh, between these fabrics and the French manufacturers in Lyon? Ah, well, there was a lot of interaction between the manufacturers in Lyon and in uh, Russia. Vladimir Sapochnikov actually bought a huge number of these, these um, the weaving, the jacquard looms that were used in France. And they're very, very close. I think it's hard to tell them apart until you get to vestments for the Orthodox Church, because of course they're unique. They're from this tradition that is much, you know, it stretches back and is clearly in dialogue with all of these wonderful late Byzantine garments that are in the Moscow Kremlin, largely that's where they reside and in fact by the way if you need to know about um about um ottoman textiles one of the best places to look is at 16th century russian vestments because it preserves beautifully some of these diplomatic gifts Uh, so another question kind of relating to cultural exchanges in different spaces and these artifacts. Uh, one individual writes, I am interested in motifs. Uh, in your research, have you come across any artistic exchanges with imperial China and Persian culture? Uh, yes, in fact, there are, uh, for Persia, yes, there are actually some really magnificent textiles that came as part of diplomatic gifts. And they were then copied in uh, these 16th, 17th century textiles were then sort of taken on board and understood as Russian, traditionally Russian, and copied in, um, copied in modern 19th or modern 19th century vestments. And actually the museum has an example that in incorporates some of these elements, but more importantly, the museum has a vestment that I couldn't force in here and I wish I could have. It's made out of Central Asian ikat, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And it was a gift of um, Elizabeth Fyodorovna. So, uh, and as for China, I don't know. I would have to think about that. I showed you a picture of the Sapochnikov stand at Nizhny Novgorod in 1896, and I didn't point out because I thought it would make things even more complicated. All of the fabrics there are clearly based on Chinese imperial gowns and robes and things like that. 
I hope that answered the question. All right, uh, so next question. These were so expensive. Were they reworked later for services or were they considered too special for other services? Each clergy member we know took them back, the senior clergy took them back. The, we were talking about in Kazan, the museum there has an extraordinary, extraordinary collection that came from the sacristy of the Archbishop of Kazan. And others, I think, stayed in the Moscow Kremlin. I don't know, unfortunately, if they were reused. And I don't know the process by which they were selected or not selected for being sold through these Soviet agencies or being kept for, I I'm surprised they weren't all sold off because this was just too late, not their interest. All right, so I'm going to leave room for this question and then one final question before uh, ending things today for the lecture. Uh, but this individual writes, thank you for this exciting lecture. Uh, do you have any information about the reuse of some part of these fabrics for the 1903 Winter Palace costume ball? Um, thank you for calling it exciting, my fellow textile nerd, wherever you are. Um, I, I feel so happy there. <laughs> I know that Sapochnikov supplied a lot of the textiles in, the, in this taste for that ball. And also people actually use 17th century textiles. There is Sapochnikov's um, partial, the outer fabrics are their creation. And the sleeve I think you can see is older and has pearl embroidery. I don't think anything from the coronation from church textiles would have been repurposed for this event, but I could be wrong. I don't know everything about this. So if someone else knows, please, please sing out. But that seems um, a step too far to take coronation vestments and repurpose them for a costume party. All right, so final question here. Uh, another thanks for a fabulous talk. Uh, and did this firm sell its wares to the customers at World's Fairs? Uh, did they mostly come to the U.S. only in sales after 1917? Uh, how did these objects make their way to the U.S. firm specific? Yes, they, yes, thank you for this question. Um, I think when I realized how long this was, I cut this out. So in 1876 and 1893, when they showed, they brought two examples of everything because this was a selling exhibition and they did sell it. They didn't want to, too expensive to carry it back. And I think things were gifted if they weren't sold, but all of Sapochnikov's textiles were acquired by two universities who shall be not, not be named. And both of them deaccessioned at some point. It was very unclear when these were um, art tech, you know, this was for technical students to study industry. Those, you saw that Philadelphia was able to acquire one textile and bring it back to their collection. So if you find these, this is why I showed everyone the salvage. If you find these, this is really important. So they are out there. And uh, certainly they sold off. The Soviets were quite happy to sell these off after you know, when tourism sort of kicked in in the late 20s, early 30s. And otherwise, they have kind of languished in Russian museum storerooms. They have, there hasn't been much attention, but this is a good thing. The Hermitage right now has on one of the first exhibitions ever about Russian vestments. And um, I bring this up because if you can navigate to it on their website, they've made the catalog available for free. It's in Russian, unfortunately, but you can download it for free, richly illustrated. And um, if it's okay, maybe I can figure out a way to give Hannah the link and make it accessible. But if you happen to be going to Russia because of COVID, they've been able to extend the schedule. It's going to be on view quite a long time, I think well into uh, early January of next year. So yes, there's finally more attention to them. 
All right, that's always very excellent to hear. Uh, thank you all for your questions, your participation in today's lecture. Final thank you again to Karen. I am also amazed by the textiles. By no means am I a textile nerd, but I might be getting there. Uh, <laughs> so we are going to transfer over finally to Michael, who will provide us with some closing remarks. Uh, so Michael, when you are ready. Thank you everybody for participating in today's fantastic lecture. Karen, this was uh, fabulous. I was fascinated to learn some new things about the pieces in our collection. If I'm going to be cataloging um, textiles, I'm certainly giving you a call. Um, also, it's always fascinating to, to speak to Karen. We work together on the traditions and opulence uh, loans that are now at the Museum of Russian Icons in Clinton. Um, I also wanted to point out that our um, uh, lectures are um, recorded and so Nick's uh, from uh, last month is available on our YouTube channel. Karen's will be up as well and I also wanted to note that this is our first guest lecture so the, the first two lectures were excuse the crowing in the background those are my children <laughs> uh, being occupied. Um, uh, uh, the first two were by members of the museum staff, so this is a milestone for us to have a guest lecture, and that is a nice segue into our next lecture, which is going to be on September 12th. Um, it's going to be by Marie Bedeli, who is a gemologist and a specialist in Russian jewelry, and her upcoming book is, ca uh, is called Beyond Fabergé Imperial Russian Jewelry. So uh, we are very much looking forward to that lecture, and I hope that um, all of you will join us for that as well. Thank you for attending and thank you for your support.